Welcome to day two of the Ed Forum. Thanks for joining us. I'm Carl Lissman. I'm an IWMF trustee where I serve as treasurer and chair of the finance committee. Um, my diagnosis of WM occurred in 2017. So earlier this year, I uh, celebrated my five year anniversary of diagnosis. And, uh, and I say celebrate it. Uh, if people had listened to Jennifer Byer's uh, comments just preceding this session, uh, she talked several times about gratitude. And, uh, and that's how I feel about uh, my WM diagnosis. Uh, I feel a lot better than I did before I was diagnosed. And uh, I hope that will continue for a long, long time to come. I live in Yardley, PA, which is a suburb of Philadelphia, and uh, live there with my wife. We're near our children and our grandchildren, um, and uh, we're enjoying uh, our early retirement years. Uh, with our next superstar presenter, we're going to build on the success we've had thus far in the program. Uh, and I'm honored to be able to introduce Dr. Steve Ansell of the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Uh, where he serves as chair of the Division of Hematology. Dr. Ansel is an IMF trustee as well, and also serves as co-chair of the Scientific Advisory Committee for the IWMF. He has spoken to almost countless numbers of IWMF groups over the years, and uh, including many uh, of the ed forums. And all those presentations, he's widely recognized for his ability to present complex topics in an easy to understand manner. His topic today is unusual complications of WM. And at the conclusion of his presentation, he's gonna keep an extra amount of time to be able to answer questions. So it's important that you put your questions in that you have uh, into the question mark at the bottom of the, the, the fifth uh, circle over in the bottom of the screen, because that's where he'll be looking for the questions and we'll We'll address those after his presentation. So welcome, Dr. Ansel, and uh, you're ready to go. Carl, thank you very much and really very grateful for the opportunity to uh, join you. And as Carl mentioned, I wanted to, the, the talk is very broad. There are lots of topics that we're going to cover. I'm going to try and keep it simple, but I wanted to make sure that everybody knows there's plenty of opportunity for people to please ask questions. So feel free to enter your questions into the Q&A and uh, we'll do our best to circle to those questions at the end. <clears throat> so um, as was mentioned, this uh, focus is on unusual comp uh, complications and specifically focusing on uh, concerns and best practices. So what I hope to be able to do is to share what they are what uh, you may anticipate as a patient having happen when you get these complications. And then specifically, you'll see, we'll circle back to some ways in which they are treated. But because there's such diversity in the different presentations and the different uh, circumstances, want to make sure that uh, there's opportunities for folks to ask questions that may be of, mo of greatest interest to them. So here's what I hope to talk about. <clears throat> Going to start again take you back to exactly what is Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. And I think that's really important because as we talk about the complications, you'll see that the complications come directly from the nature of the disease. So the two things that I want you to hear about is Waldenstrom's is really a lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma present in the bone marrow typically, but also can be in the lymph nodes or in the spleen or other organs. So the direct presence of those cancer cells are one issue. The second issue is the circulating monoclonal protein, and it has really unique characteristics. And so these unique characteristics are what also contribute to the complications and unusual presentations that I will talk about. So really the complications that I want to highlight come from three specific issues, and we'll talk about these as we go through. Number one is the tumor cells themselves present typically in the bone marrow or somewhere else, their presence causes problems. The second challenge, and we'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute, is the nature of an IgM protein. One of the things I want you to remember is this is a very big protein. So when these big proteins begin to accumulate in the blood, they, by their nature, 
the physical property will thicken the blood and that will cause problems by itself. Furthermore, that protein is pretty unique in that it's very sticky, if you like. And because it's so sticky, it will then attach to things. And when it binds to cells or to tissue, that also precipitates a bunch of, uh, of side effects and complications, which we'll talk about. So you're going to see me talk about the, the complications due to the tumor infiltration, the physical nature of the IgM protein and the stickiness of the IgM protein. So this is just to remind you and to give you a visual for you to be able to think about it. <clears throat> so this lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate that you see in the bone marrow is what you're seeing on the left of the picture here. And these are cells, typically lymphoplasmacytic cells. So just cast your mind back for a minute and remember that this is kind of part of your normal biology that's now become abnormal. So normally if you breathe in a pollen, a foreign protein, a virus, COVID, whatever, uh, infection of any kind, the way in which your immune system deals with it is that foreign protein is presented to the immune system. And when that happens, lymphocytes change into plasma cells and plasma cells make immunoglobulin or antibodies. And so this process of changing from the one lymphocyte to the other plasma cell is the process that becomes abnormal when you have Waldenstrom. So the lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate is this transition between the lymphocytes and the plasma cells that went awry. And you've been hearing or know about various genetic mutations and things that have been seen that are part of that process that cause the cells then to become jammed. What's also important and very interesting about this is that in this process of going from a lymphocyte to a plasma cell, the type of antibody that the cell makes changes. So it starts off and it makes an IgM protein. And the reason it does that, the IgM is the quick response protein. Its goal is to quickly stick to anything that looks like a threat. So it's not as sophisticated and as focused as the subsequent IgG that gets made. But what it does is it quickly tries to dampen down and control the immune, the immune threat, the, the infection or whatever. And so then as, as time goes by, the immune system gets trained and that IgM starts to diminish and the immune system starts to make the laser missiles, as it were, the IgG antibodies. But when you have the, the whole process jammed, in this lymphoplasmacytic phase, the protein that it is making is as what you can see on the right of the screen here, an IgM protein. And you can see it's a pentamer, this five antibodies all together, the very kind of big, sticky, and, uh, and, and, and very relevant in controlling the immune system right off the bat. This is just taking us a little deeper as we're gonna be talking in a minute, about the complications that come from the presence of these cells. So just reminding you, these lymphoplasmacytic cells, you can see the arrows pointing to them. Those are the ones with more of a plasmacytic look to them. You can see the nucleus is off to the one side. You can see it's got this blue cytoplasm and that blue cytoplasm is largely IgM or immunoglobulin. The other thing that's important about these cells is as we mentioned, there are various genetic abnormalities. The MYD88 mutation or CXCR4 mutations are very commonly seen uh, in these cells. This just shows you a little bit more and we'll talk about this in greater detail in just a second, but I wanted again just to stress this big protein for really five antibodies together and not as highly specific as, as to what it will stick to. It can stick to many things that are somewhat similar. And as I'll talk about in a second, if anything in your body has any degree of similarity, even if it's not that close to what the antibody would typically stick to, it will stick to those tissues or organs in your body and potentially cause problems. So there are three kind of symptoms that can develop, and that is the big nature of the protein makes the blood thick, and it physically disrupts circulation and hyperviscosity is a problem. The second thing is <clears throat> it can then stick to different 
tissues and become deposited. And when it does that, it thickens tissue and certain tissues don't tolerate that very well. And then finally, it may actually stick to other antibodies or other proteins. And when it does that, that can cause anything from anemia or bleeding problems or uh, being entrapped in tissues causing vasculitis or other problems like that. So going to start off with talking about the first issue, and that's the complications related purely to the fact that there are cells that are in places they don't belong. And as I mentioned in a minute, when they do that, they may also then prevent other healthy cells from doing their job. So here's the first issue, and that's simply the infiltration of the bone marrow and other organs like lymph nodes or spleen <clears throat> by the presence of these lymphoplasmic cytic cells. So what you're seeing here on the left is a picture, what's called an H&E stain, where they're just looking at the cells in the bone marrow. The big white blobs that you're seeing around are fat. So as you get older, your bone gets more, bone marrow gets more fatty. So really, the easy way to remember how fatty your bone marrow is supposed to be, if you take 100 and subtract your age, that's the amount of cellularity that you're supposed to have. So if you were 60 years old, you should have no more than 40% cellularities in the bone marrow. But you can clearly see that more than 40% of this bone marrow has cells in it. So that would suggest that this bone marrow is way more active than it should right, rightfully be. And as you can see on the right of the slide, this is a stain now for CD20. And this is purely just looking to see if the cells are copies of each other and if they are B cells. And you can see this dark brown stuff, which means all of those cells are lymphoplasmacytic B cells. <clears throat> and so because of that, we know that these cells are not normal, healthy kind of bone marrow. This bone marrow is becoming replaced by the presence of these lymphoma cells. Why is that important? Well, what it does is it crowds out healthy other cells. And when it does that, you can get low blood counts. Also, it mucks with the bone marrow's ability to manage different proteins and different elements. So for example, people become often quite anemic and that's because of the cells being crowded out, the healthy ones, but also because of the body's ability to handle iron gets compromised. And when it does that through a protein called hepcidin, the bone marrow again uh, fails to work well and you don't make enough red cells and you become anemic. So that's a real issue. And one of the reasons that treatments work very well, so for example, BTK inhibitors quickly reverse the function of the, these, these cells. And when it does that, many times the anemia begins to get better right away. So the message I want you to see here is, the presence of these cells in the bone marrow can cause problems such as low, uh, low red cells or low platelets or even problems with enough white cells because there's simply no space for there to be good function of the healthy bone marrow. The second thing that also happens is that you can have other organs become infiltrated and people can get big livers, big spleens, um, potentially enlarged lymph nodes, and all of those can press on other uh, organs or cause other symptoms, all of it related to too many cells that simply just don't belong. The further thing that's important, and many of you will know uh, this can affect your life uh, pretty substantially, is that when this IgM protein goes up very high and these cells are crowding the bone marrow, the ability of other cells to make normal immunoglobulin or normal antibodies goes down. And also treatment that we give for patients with uh, Waldenstrom's affects not only the good cells, but the bad cells as, as well. And so when it does that, many times the number of, of cells able to make healthy IgG or healthy IgM goes down. And then when you get low immunoglobulins, that puts you at significant risk for infection. So you know, reminding you again that there are two parts of your immune system. The one part are kind of the cellular hand-to-hand -hand combat part of the immune system. The other side is the antibody. It's kind of like the missile side of the, of the immune system. So you still have the cells in place many times, but often they're not enough of the uh, missiles, if you like, of the antibodies 
that can really work well. And so when you get hypogamma globulinemia, that really just means low amounts of immunoglobulin in your system, be it either from too many bad cells crowding out the good ones or the treatment to kill the bad ones affecting the good ones as well, you have significant risk for infections. And that's why in some patients, they will be put on IVIG infusions. And that just basically means collecting uh, immunoglobulin or antibodies from other people, purifying them, and then just giving them to you on typically a once a month basis as a way to replace the antibodies that your body is not making. That's a somewhat imperfect uh, circumstance. The reason is just that it's obviously somebody else's immune system. They may have been exposed to different things to you, but it certainly helps a lot with some of the more common infections which can profoundly affect people. A further, and this is probably the third way in which the presence of cells can cause substantial issues. This is where you actually get the cells, not now just in the bone marrow or in the lymph nodes or in the spleen or the liver, but now it goes into the cerebrospinal fluid. That's the fluid around your, your, around your, um, your nerves or into your brain. So you can see in these pictures here, in that panel A, what you're looking at is a MRI scan with a slice through a, a patient's brain. And you can see that white area that's outlined on both sides is abnormal an uptake, suggesting that there are extra cells there. On the one that you can see on the panel B, you can actually see that the lining around the outside of the brain is quite bright. And then there's the speckled kind of appearance on the inside. That's a little bit of a different picture, but also can uh, be because of the presence of lymphoplasmacytic cells or Waldenstrom cells in the brain. And in panel C, what you're looking at there is this whiteness that you can see down at the bottom. This is in the area of the spine called the corda equina. And what that is, is a collection now of the cells that have tracked down in the fluid around the spine and collecting around the base of the spine. <clears throat> the problem with having these cells present is they mess with the function of nerves. Nerves don't like other cells in the way, don't like other cells touching them that don't belong there. And when they do that, the cells often cause malfunction of the nerve function and people can have all kinds of neurological issues. Some of, their, some of their sensation can change, their nerve function can change, their ability to actually move can be affected. And um, we can certainly discuss that uh, if people have questions related to that. But typically the same treatment that's given for the uh, Waldenstrom's in the body is given for this bing Neal syndrome, and many of them can be very effective. So the treatment is often either a brutinib or alternatively bendamustine plus rituximab. So then, uh, so those were the three main areas that I wanted you to hear about basically the presence of Waldenstrom cells, either in the bone marrow, crowding out other cells, causing anemia, causing problems with low immunoglobulin, or in the brain where it's causing problems with neurological function purely by the physical presence of these cells. The second thing I wanted to talk about is now coming to the protein the fact that the protein can cause significant complications. And as I mentioned to you, it can do it in multiple ways. And I'll go through that in a little bit more detail. Number one, it's a big protein, so it makes the blood thick. That's a problem. Secondly, it's a sticky protein, so it sticks to stuff. And that becomes a problem. And the third thing is that it can actually have very specific cross reactions with other, other proteins, and that is also a substantial issue. So I'll explain to you now a few of those different ways and how it impacts uh, uh, people often when their protein is high, uh, but it doesn't need to be high. So sometimes it, when you have a hyperviscosity, your protein can be very high. But sometimes if you have problems, for example, like cold agglutinin disease, where you start to get anemia because your protein is attaching itself to red cells, you only need a very small amount you just have cold weather and a small amount, and that causes substantial problems. So here's the first issue, and that's the issue of hyperviscosity. So just reminding you, what exactly is that? 
generally speaking, hyperviscosity comes from these big protein molecules in the blood at higher levels, thickening the blood, if you like. Now, I get a lot of questions about when does that happen. In general, it's pretty uncommon for people to get hyperviscosity issues when their protein is less than about four and a half, maybe 5,000 milligrams or five grams. <clears throat> so if you have an IgM protein that's 3,000 and you're being told that you have hyperviscosity, I would just have folks look at that a little bit more carefully because purely the amount of protein and when you only have three or four, maybe two or 3,000 milligrams in your blood, is not sufficient to thicken it to the degree at which these patients that I'll show in these images are affected. So what you're seeing here on the left at the top is a person who's getting a lot of skin ulcers related to hyperviscosity. And the reason that happens is the blood gets thickened and oxygen is not delivered very effectively to areas that are called watershed areas. So your bottom of your legs is at a place where two of the, um, of the blood systems kind of come together. And so if neither of them are really delivering blood very well, that's an area that can very easily run short of oxygen. So that's why you can often get skin ulcers on your ankles if, uh, if you have hyperviscosity. You can see a CAT scan in the middle with lots of white. You might have learned already from what I mentioned that white on a scan of your brain is never a good thing. And what's happening here is not enough oxygen is being delivered to the brain because of the fact that there's such a thickened blood that that actually then causes the brain tissue to malfunction. Often, you know, the patient will notice if they feel like they're in a fog, they can't think straight, they say weird stuff, their family members think they've completely changed. Those are all symptoms associated with hyperviscosity. What you're seeing on the right is a picture of the back of somebody's eye. And what you're looking for here is the fact that now, because the blood is so thick, you get what is called sausaging, where you actually see little blobs of it kind of blobbing its way through the blood vessel because it's not going through efficiently because, again, the blood is so thick, almost treacle-like, if you like. So because of that, you get people have visual problems, they can't think straight, and they can't see well as part of the hyperviscosity. And then you can see a patient with Raynaud's phenomena on the bottom left. That's again, where not enough oxygen and not enough blood delivery is happening to the fingers and toes. And you can see they turn profoundly white, like you can see in this picture here. So now I'm going to tell you a little bit about two and or actually a few other ways in which these proteins misbehave. And um, a, a number of them are very interesting, um, but they are really irritating and problematic for patients when that happens. So there are two problems that can happen that can be associated with cold. So interesting thing about these proteins, particularly the IgM, it behaves differently depending on the body's temperature. So if you live in a cold environment where the fingers and toes can get really cold, um, you can have quite substantial issues with the protein then becoming either increasingly sticky or coagulating and sticking to other proteins and causing problems. So the first of these issues is what you see here is called cryoglobulinemia. And you can see on the uh, left-hand side that there's actually sedimentation which happens of, these pro of the protein because what it's doing is it's complexing with other immunoglobulins. So this IgM is now sticking to other, often IgG. And when it does that, it now becomes a very irritating protein. And you can see on the right, it sticks in tissues and causes a leukocytoclastic vasculitis. It's just a fancy name for an irritated part, particularly in this case, in the skin. But you can get that in any organ. So basically what's happening, it's a little bit like you left the milk out too long and it began to congeal. And when you poured it into your coffee, you got all those blobs going in and it generally doesn't taste very good. It's the same principle. The protein is now congealing, sticking to things and forming blobs. And the blobs get stuck in different organs, causing substantial difficulty. And this actually can happen even if your protein is not that high, your IgM levels. And so the challenge here is obviously to try and avoid that from happening. And it's often associated with the, with the temperature 
uh, of the body or of the, this protein particularly. So you want to be careful if you have this kind of problem when you're exposed to extreme cold. And the same is true with the other issue that I'll talk about, and that's called cold agglutinin disease. And really what you're seeing here is now it's not sticking to other proteins. Now it's actually sticking to red cells. And this is, again, a substantial problem where the antibody, the IgM protein, is pulling red cells together because, remember, it's got five different proteins, five different uh, immunoglobulins make up IgM. So it sticks to lots of things. And you can see how in the middle picture in B, a lot of these red cells are clumping. And you can see it again in C. They're all kind of stuck together. Now, the reason that's a problem is you have in your body the spleen, and the spleen is quality control. It looks at this and goes, I do not like what I'm seeing at all. And so it starts chomping up any cells that are stuck together. And so that's where you get anemia and a, 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 a hemolytic process. In other words, your body is now breaking down the red cells. So the first issue, cryoglobulin, you get these complexes. The complexes of proteins irritate the tissue. In this case, you've got the protein sticking the red cells together and the immune system, in this case, the spleen, taking that out. And so people get very low hemoglobins because of they have this agglutination and then they have what's called hemolysis. Now, how do you prevent this? Well, clearly you need to treat and get rid of the protein that's causing the problem. But this is also triggered very much by temperature. So there's each of these proteins have what they call a thermal amplitude, where at a certain temperature, they get super sticky. So staying above that temperature is really key. So if you have this kind of issue, aside from treating it, sometimes the best strategy is to move to Arizona, where the temperature is likely to be higher and not likely to precipitate this problem. <clears throat> so... Yet another problem, and you'll see we've got a few more to go here about the sticky kind of uh, protein that, uh, that causes issues. So many people who've had Waldenstrom's might remember that when they were diagnosed, they could have had some real problems with bleeding, particularly bleeding gums. They brushed their teeth and it was just really impressive how much oozing and bleeding they got from their gums. And what's happening here is you can see... Uh, in the top left picture, something called Van Willebrand's factor. So when you have the body that is being stressed and coagulation and clotting needs to happen, there are two parts of what allows your, co your clotting to happen. One is the platelets, the plugs, and the others are the proteins which form little spindles which help to capture and stick those plugs right in the area that's bleeding. In the side, when you're taking these platelets and they need to form plugs, a protein that helps them to stick together is called Van Willebrand's factor. Now, the problem is that if you have your IgM, for whatever reason, really finding itself attracted to the Van Willebrand's factor, it takes that Van Willebrand's factor out of the circulation because it sticks to it. And when it does that, the platelets are floating around and they don't connect and stick with each other very well, and they don't form good plugs to stop you from bleeding and oozing. So that's why you can see in these pictures, people can have nosebleeds a lot more than usual. They can have very easily bleeding gums. They can bruise, uh, and sometimes it can be quite life-threatening. Not that common, but certainly can happen. Now I'm going to touch now on a topic which, again, is the same principle of what's happening but it's something that is much more common and many on this call might well have experienced this and that is called peripheral neuropathy. So what does that mean? In essence, what's happening again, the sticky protein is now sticking to proteins that are in the nerve, nerve sheath. So if you can imagine your nerve is like an electrical wire and just like electrical wires in your house, they have a plastic coating on the outside, the electrical wires do. And if you pull that coating off, that puts you at significant risk of getting a shock or a short circuiting the entire system. So if you can imagine your nerve is like that and it's got a coating on the outside, the nerve sheath. Now, if the antibodies, the IgM proteins stick to the nerve sheath, the body hates things that are stuck on, on other things. So the trash collectors in your body called the macrophages, they will come and just chomp off 
that antibody that's stuck on the outside. The problem with that is it's like you pulled the plastic off the electrical wire. Now you've got a wire that's kind of out there just waiting to touch another wire and create a short circuit. So that's why people can have all kinds of nerve pains and those kinds of issues. You can see in the image here, <clears throat> this person has a very kind of misshapen foot with a raised arch and he's toed because the nerves are so affected that now the muscles are pulling a little too much in one area and not enough in another causing significant issues. And you can see on the right, we can detect this uh, with using EMG testing where we can measure the speed of conduction and whether there are those short circuits, if you like. So with all of that said, you can actually detect many times these antibodies and whether they are sticking to the nerves or not. And that can be a test that your doctor may do. One more, I think there's actually two more coming that uh, can happen is that what's called systemic amyloidosis. So this is purely a circumstance now <clears throat> where there is too much of the immunoglobulin or fragments of the IgM protein being deposited in tissue. And you can see here's a person with what's called macroglossia. You can see the person's tongue is bigger than it should be. So much so that it, the teeth are kind of causing indentations as this tongue is kind of packing out what should be inside the mouth. You can see here this person has a, a black eye and the reason is again because of the protein depositing in the little blood vessels, those blood vessels become super uh, uh, leaky and you can have significant problems with a very easy bleeding or bruising uh, often around the eyes. And you can then see in the bottom the way in which we can detect that we can actually take what's called a fat aspirate. So many times if you've had this done, they'll either do it in your bone marrow or they'll do it in your, your stomach. They'll just take a little chunk of fat out of your, uh, out of your abdominal uh, wall and then look for the presence of the protein that you can see highlighted right here. <clears throat> and then a final way is that again, IgM can deposit, but not necessarily an amyloid IgM. But this would cause what's called Schnitzler's, Schnitzler's uh, syndrome, which is a skin irritation or skin inflammation that comes from the deposition. And you can see this patient here with this kind of like textured, if you like, rash that depends that's all over the body, but particularly in this person on their trunk, uh, secondary to the fact that the protein is now being deposited in the skin. So you might say, well, that's a lot of information. I've highlighted a variety of different complications. How many of these are things I might see in my experience versus how many of these are very unusual? And I would put to you that many of them are quite unusual. But what I wanted to highlight here is that some of them are not. And this was a study now done quite a long time ago where just over 200 patients who presented with full-blown Waldenstrom's, in other words, a lot of bone marrow involvement, a pretty high IgM level. And the question was asked, what were the symptoms they presented with? So this just highlights the fact that actually about a quarter of them, still even with all of that going on, didn't actually have symptoms. The second issue, well, the second thing that was commonly seen was anemia. So remember I said to you, Lots of bone marrow replacement by these lymphoplasmacytic cells make the bone normal, healthy bone marrow unable to function. That hepcidin protein can interfere. And so anemia was pretty common. The hyperviscosity was also seen in just under a third of patients. And this, as we mentioned before, is when people suddenly have difficulty thinking straight. They suddenly have difficulty with vision. They can get that Raynaud's phenomenon in their fingers. Um, other issues, and this purely is from the size of the protein. You can see here about the fevers and drenching sweats. Often that's again to do with the infiltration of the cells in different parts of the body. You can see the mention here in about 25% of patients who had bleeding. So remember I mentioned that protein called Van Willebrand's disease, or Van Willebrand's factor being depleted. The plugs can't plug properly, so bleeding can be seen. And then finally, neurological symptoms, which can come from two reasons. One, the hyperviscosity, so the blood's not flowing to your brain very well, but also because it deposited on the actual nerve sheath, 
and the ma macrophages, the trash collectors chomped it off. And when it did that, you get short circuiting of those nerves. So that's to give just some context that some of these things are more common and others are a lot less common. So in the last few minutes here, I just wanted to talk about, well, so that's what could happen. If they happen, what are really the, the key principles of how you deal with it or manage it? So the first thing I think that is important to know is you've got to go to the source. You've got to go after the cells that are making the protein so that you can then switch off the protein production and stop this whole process that's developed. So using uh, treatments like chemoimmunotherapy, so this would be something like bendamustine plus rituximab, a BTK inhibitor, that would be like a brutinib or xanabrutinib, um, or proteasome inhibitors, that would be like bortezomib-based um, treatments. All of those are very reasonable options that could be used. Now, I want to just stress that it's important to recognize there's actually a two-step issue here. You're first going to treat the cancer. It will get the cancer and cell numbers to go down. They will make less protein. But remember, the protein has already done its damage. So it's not going to immediately necessarily get better. It's going to take time for the body now who doesn't have to deal with more protein. The protein shut off. But it's going to need to get rid of the protein that's already there. So sometimes that can take quite a long time. And sometimes, unfortunately, some of the symptoms, like, for example, neuropathy, might not resolve at all because the damage was done and it's not reversible, even if you stop the process. So then the next thing is, well, what can you do about the symptoms? And yes, there are a variety of different other medications which could be given. If you have neuropathy, there are medications to help the irritating neuropathic pain from being better. If you have uh, cold gluten or cryoglobulin uh, problems, you can stay away from cold and that can help. If you have bleeding, you can specifically treat that. So there are ways in which you can work on a symptom level and ways in which you can work on a cancer level. And then when you have the hyperviscosity type of issue, it's important sometimes to go ahead with what's called plasmapheresis. I kind of joke and tell patients it's like an oil change. You're really just going to get rid of all the thick plasma that's in your bone marrow that's in your blood and replace it with saline and other and more healthy if you like thinner blood liquid of in your blood to help to prevent this whole hyperviscosity issue so how exactly does that work well here you can see a person on a plasmapheresis machine in general it's when patients have problems with uh, visual deterioration with the neurological symptoms and bleeding and remember, I said this is not commonly seen if your protein is under 4,000. I'd even say it's not commonly seen unless you get up around the 5,000 and higher level. <clears throat> Important to realize, however, this is purely a Band-Aid. This is a stopgap. It's just a cleaning off of the protein. It doesn't fix anything. You need to have something that's going to treat the cancer cells to stop them from making the protein. Um, so uh, this is just to highlight uh, the actual hyperviscosity that you can see in the eye. You can see some of that sausaging that's shown in the top with some of those arrows, uh, particularly the ones in the top right. You can also see that you can get bleeding in the eye. You can get uh, some exudates, which is oozing of plasma out into the eye, all of which can really affect your ability to see. Once the blood is cleaned up, as it were, you can see significant improvement, uh, as you can see on the right. So all told, this is an interim measure, while in parallel, you should be treating the cancer directly. One thing just to note and make sure people understand is that using rituximab on its own can sometimes make viscosity worse. So just remember, it's a better strategy to use it in combination with other therapy and to use it kind of a little after the treatment that you might have given initially. So with that, I'd like to end. I'd like to thank you for your time and attention. Specifically, just remind you that there are two specific reasons why you get these complications, the cells and the protein. And obviously, at the end of the day, treating patients specifically 
for whatever the issue is actually requires you to get after the tumor cells, the cancer cells themselves. So with that, I'll thank you for you again for uh, inviting me to participate. And I'm going to, with Carl's help, do our, my best to answer as many of the questions as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ansel. Um, you know, the, your discussion was obviously very effective in generating the questions you would ask people to bring. So uh, you answered many, but uh, there were there were lots of questions that presented. So we'll just jump right into those. Uh, and the first couple are related to uh, Bing Neal syndrome. And uh, there was a, a question about uh, treatment, uh, but someone, there are two different questions. One is about a person who recently diagnosed with Bing Neal and uh, is going to be beginning treatment and is wondering what they can look forward to. And then the second issue uh, is a person who has, uh, who's wondering if rituxan and bendamustine is an effective treatment for big meal. So the first person is on a and the and this is rituxan and uh, bendamustine as an alternative. Yep, so thanks, Carl. I mean, I think the important thing for people to know is both of those are effective therapies. So bendamustine plus rituximab has had uh, good effects and abrutinib has had good effects. So both are good choices. And what could you expect? Well, the key thing we wanna do is we wanna have the, the cells that are present in the brain or around the spinal fluid and the spinal column, have them be suppressed by the treatment. And that usually is effectively done over the course of a few weeks. So what can you expect? Hopefully you tolerate the treatment well, most people do. And at the same time, that's many of the neurological symptoms that you might be experiencing that was the tip off that you had the problem in the first place, those should get better. So the key is if they're not getting better, that always requires people to keep looking to see if something else is going on. But you should see an improvement, I would say over the course of the first four to six weeks. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is, uh, is there a difference between the level of serum viscosity as measured in the body uh, and as measured in the brain? Can they be different in the same person? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, bottom line is there's actually not a lot of work done on understanding the viscosity in the fluid around the brain. But in general, the body is very good at equilibrizing things. And remember also, it's what's happening in the brain when you have hyperviscosity is actually happening mainly in the blood vessels which are traveling through the brain. So actually those are pretty much one and the same issue. The viscosity is probably likely to be quite similar between the two. Regardless of whether there was a difference between the two, that's not really the issue. The main issue is you need to decrease the viscosity because clearly not delivering oxygen like you should to organs and to tissues are causing real problems. So um, I think while it's an interesting question, at the end of the day, the way you manage it is the same, and that is decrease the hyperviscosity as soon as you can. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so the, uh, the question is about uh, looking at dosages and is there a way to determine when it's the right time to ask about lowering dosages? It doesn't say the specific drug, but I'm thinking maybe it might be uh, ibutinib or others. So thoughts about reducing dosages. Yeah, so the main reason is to say, why would you consider to decrease a dose? And I think in some respects, there are two main reasons. The one is, you are doing so fantastically well on the treatment. The treatment has the Waldenstrom so well controlled that it's not clear that you need as much treatment as you've had before. And the ways in which you may decrease the doses are, is if you've got a fantastic response and you're getting a chemo immunotherapy like bendamustine or rituximab, rather than getting six cycles, you may only need four, for example. Similarly, if you're on a drug like abrutinib and you're taking three pills or, or one big three pill equivalent tablet every day and you, you've been doing wonderfully and your protein is super low, but you have some concerns about easy bruising or that kind of issue, then certainly decreasing a dose is very reasonable. What, but what you're doing is you're going from a position of strength. You say, we've got great control. Let's get the, the least we need to maintain the control. The second issue as to why you might decrease the doses, you're not tolerating the treatment very well. 
So the treatment is causing problems, whether that be a chemotherapy related problems or whether that be uh, irregular heartbeat issues in the case of a brutinib or easy bruising and bleeding, that kind of issue. And you're now trying to find a sweet spot where you're trying to get the best dose that would have good effects on the cancer, but yet be adequately tolerated. Those are slightly different. In general, in my practice, I try and go at a good dose, maintain the dose, get the best result we can, and only at that point back off. Only time to make an adjustment is if you really aren't tolerating treatment well, but the challenge then is sometimes you're not as effective in your treatment of controlling the cancer, so you have to weigh those up. Okay, great, thank you. The uh, next question is about uh, uh, what is the better treatment for amyloidosis, a BTK inhibitor or a chemo or some other approach? Yeah, so that again is often quite a challenging issue because obviously you want to do something treatment-wise that decreases the amount of protein that's being deposited. Now, the reason I say it's a difficult question is that amyloid can be deposited but sometimes it can be deposited in places that cause a lot of problems for a patient versus other times it's in places where it doesn't cause a lot of problems for a patient so you have a bit of a different strategy if the protein is highly risky and you need to really do something right away to try and avoid that versus less risky so the principles are that you want to control the protein making cells. So all of the treatments we've spoken about are very reasonable, but sometimes if there's a really significant high risk to the patient before it gets to the point where it's become devastatingly high risk, it may be necessary to use a high dose chemotherapy approach in those patients. All right. I, I think you've already answered this in your presentation, but maybe you can just quickly confirm that. It, this is about an individual who has Raynaud's following her WM, and uh, it's spreading, and she's asking, is this a complication from WM? Yeah, so it certainly can be, and there's sort of different ways in which it can, it can be true. So remember I said that you can get poor delivery of oxygen because of uh, hyperviscosity, number one, but also because of cryoglobulins and uh, cold agglutinins, where the things are sticking together and therefore causing problems with delivery. Those are very common as causes for people to have Raynaud's. So um, I think if, if that's happening more frequently than before, two questions to ask. One is, is the weather changing? Because if that's true, often that can make it worse. Or two, is my disease changing? In other words, is it getting more active so that the protein is now more abundant and causing more of the problems. That's something to check out with your doctor. All right, thank you. There are a number of questions uh, regarding um, GI and digestive issues. Uh, and um, I'm, I'm, so I'm gonna try and consolidate those in, into this one. Uh, this is an individual uh, who had digestive issues. Uh, doctors were having trouble trying to figure out exactly what was the cause of it. And uh, it was only after a large spleen that they uh, actually had a bone marrow biopsy and determined they had WM. Uh, and so they're curious about, uh, uh, is, this, uh, uh, is there work being done about the GI issues that seem to develop uh, with WM uh, on, a, on a fairly regular basis, I would take from the questions because there's a number of people who are asking about it. Yeah, so very good question. And GI complications are difficult because they can be caused by a variety of different issues and reasons. So as this was mentioned in this person's case, if you have your spleen getting very big, your spleen presses right on your stomach because it lies right next to your stomach. And you have all kinds of problems with feeling full the moment you've just had a few bites to eat because as your stomach expands, the, the spleen presses on it and makes you uncomfortable. And so that's a way in which you can get intestinal symptoms, but it's purely from what we call extrinsic pressure, pressure from the outside. The second thing is you can actually get irritation and damage and problems from these proteins depositing in the actual lining or the, the wall of the intestine, making the intestine much more stiff. And that causes problems with digestion and conduction. Third way you can have problems, remember I mentioned the nerves all going, they don't just go to muscles and other tissue, they also go to the in intestine. So if you have problems with 
the uh, wall of your bowel now not being as contractile as it needs to be because the nerves are affected, that's yet another way in which you can have significant problems with intestinal symptoms. And finally, chemotherapy, some of them can irritate the lining of the intestine, causing symptoms too. So just off the top of my head, at least four different ways in which your bowel can be affected, either by the cancer itself or the treatment. So those are things that can be very annoying, and you should be working with your doctor in trying to get the best resolution to the symptoms. Okay, thank you. Very clear. Uh, so uh, this next question is about uh, an individual who has recently been ho hospitalized for a fever of unknown origin uh, and didn't get an, a definite diagnosis, obviously. Uh, and they're curious about whether their uh, immune uh, compromised system from uh, WM is likely a, a cause of what's going on. I yeah, should so add again, a very good question. Okay. I was just okay, going to say yeah. that they did receive, uh, they did receive treatment with a, a, a BR, bendamustine and rituximab. Yeah, so the challenge with fevers of unknown origin is right in the name. It's the unknown origin part. So the challenge is just, here's a patient, has a fever, and it's not clear what's causing the fever. And there can be a variety of different ways in which Waldenstrom's can be associated with a fever for which it's hard to get a clear diagnosis. So number one, to what the, for the person who asking the question was suggesting, if you're getting treatment that decreases your immunity, and you heard me say earlier about hypogamma globulinemia, you may not have enough antibodies to help you with managing infections, you could be at real risk of getting a significant infection. Most times those infections are pretty obvious, but sometimes if your immune system has sort of got it controlled, but not perfectly well, you can have this kind of bubbling infection that kind of is under, under the surface, as it were. The second thing that's sometimes a little bit of a risk is something to watch for is something called transformation. So remember, these cells, I said, are activated. They then are in this lymphoplasmacytic transition. Genetic mistakes happen. But the problem is, if additional genetic mistakes happen, these cells can become more aggressive. And when that happens, that's not unusual to be associated with fevers, sometimes sweats and the like. So another challenge if you have these fevers of unknown origin is just to be sure that there's no clear evidence for transformation. Okay. Um... Here's an individual uh, who was diagnosed with WM after sudden kidney failure. And the question is, what relationship, what is the relationship of WM to kidney failure? Yeah, so again, very good question. You heard me say about sticky protein and the sticky protein being able to stick to tissues and get deposited in tissues, sometimes stick to other proteins and get those proteins to be irritating the immune system in other and irritating tissues uh, in, in other sites. And that's what can commonly happen. So amyloid deposits, uh, cryoglobulin deposits can all land and just IgM itself can land in the kidney. And when it does that, it prevents the kidney from filtering properly. And that's where people then get problems with their kidney function and some people can actually get florid kidney failure. Some may even require a kidney transplant. Okay. Um, so this next question is uh, an individual with, um, who, oh, I'm sorry, who's suggesting that extra nodal WM is rare in the WM community, uh, but more common with wild type WM, uh, those without MYD88 or CXR, CXCR4 mutations. Uh, and wondering, is there a more useful treatment for folks with, uh, with that? So I think what's important to know is that lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma and marginal zone lymphoma are very close cousins of each other. And many times, if you show a pathologist a biopsy of that uh, of those cases without the pathologist knowing anything about IgM protein or the patient's presentation, it's very hard to tell which is which. And so when you have the MYD88 mutation, 
in Waldenstrom's or lymphoplasmocytic lymphoma, that's present like 90 or 95% of the time. In marginal zone lymphoma, that's only present maybe around 10 to 15% of the time. So that helps. But there are some lymphoplasmocytic lymphoma patients that don't have the mutation, and there are some marginal zone lymphoma patients that do. So it's still not entirely easy to separate them. So the reason for saying that is that sometimes you may have marginal zone lymphoma when people were thinking lymphoplasmocytic lymphoma. However, to answer the question more directly, all of the patients are treated very successfully with many of the therapies, whether you get it for the one or the other. The only thing is, so for example, if you use bendamustine and rituximab, both diseases are very well treated with that combination. If you use a brutinib, both diseases are well treated with that agent. The only thing is you need to be a little more patient when you have marginal zone lymphoma and also lymphoplasmocytic lymphoma that is MYD88 wild type because it takes longer to respond. But many people still have a very nice response. Okay, this next question has a, a lot of facts behind it, so I'm going to try and uh, summarize them. Uh, a per this person had uh, a mass in the retroperitoneal area that was discovered uh, after an MRI, a PET scan, and a biopsy, and it was determined that the mass was WM cells and enlarged lymph nodes. Uh, and the question they're asking is, uh, since this was found only when their urologist ordered a CAT scan, is an annual or a yearly MRI a good way to be approaching your WM? Yeah, so again, a good question. Just to point out that retroperitoneum, which is the back of your abdomen, is packed with lymph nodes because that's where all of the stuff that drains out of your intestine typically goes through that area and it's a little bit like the TSA. They're kind of keeping an eye on who's coming through, you know, the to get on the planes. Same principle. Your lymph nodes are checking what's coming into the system from the bowel. Um, however, uh, in this case, when you had that as your predominant site of disease, that's pretty unusual. So I would say in the grand scheme of should all people with lymphoplasmocytic lymphoma Waldenstrom's have a CT or a PET scan or an MRI scan to monitor their retroperitoneal lymph nodes? No, because that's an uncommon presentation. For this patient, is it important to watch that area? Yes, we wouldn't necessarily do an MRI scan. We would typically do a CT scan intermittently. The reason is even when you've had a good response, we want to make sure you stay in response and we want to monitor to make sure that that's what's happening but it wouldn't be something we would do for everybody, but we would certainly consider it in this person. Okay, thank you. Uh, now this is kind of related to previous questions. Uh, it's about uh, frequent uh, uh, heavy diarrhea. Um, there are several questions related to that, uh, that condition. Uh, this individual uh, has uh, an IgM um, that is building up uh, and uh, wondering if there's a way to be certain that WM is not the cause and that there's something else that's causing the diarrhea. Yeah, so actually that's a good question and a hard one to answer without knowing all the facts. And here's why. You can, when your IgM is very active, have a decreased immune system that makes it quite difficult for you to fight off bowel pathogens, so infections in your intestine. So you could have diarrhea related to an infection problem. But your doctor can work that out by doing testing on the stool to see if that is true. Secondly, you can have significant problems with bowel motility. In other words, remember the bowel, I said, can either become stiff because of protein in the wall or because of interference of the nerve function. So when you have a stiff intestine, things move through much faster than they should. So again, your doctor can work that out by doing some additional testing. So there are different reasons and causes for one to have a diarrhea type symptoms. Chemotherapy, if you're on that, can cause that too. But I think in this case where it sounds like the person is not on treatment, the other two options are obviously much more likely and something that the, he or she should check out with their, with their physician. Okay. I think we're um, probably getting close to our time here. Um, so let's see if we can do uh, 
one more question maybe and that this one is related sure. to uh mucus and phlegm in the lungs and wondering is that a complication of Waldenstrom's? so most commonly that's associated with um a recurrent infection type of of, of problem so remember when your immunoglobulins are low your ability to kind of clear infections becomes compromised and so you can get more easily a greater degree of phlegm buildup uh, related to just having a low-grade infection that won't settle so that's something to definitely check out it can be associated but is not directly uh, caused by, by the Waldenstrom's and Carl I'm going to toss in one more question because somebody asked a question that I saw was sent to us kind of ahead of time and that was about a partial response to treatment and is that a good or a bad thing and i just wanted to take a second to talk about that one of the things that with all of the management of all of these diseases all of these complications and with waldenstrom's in general the goal is to create control of the underlying disease process getting the cells controlled and the protein controlled right now we're working hard to get it cured in the future but we don't actually have curative treatment right now so when all of these things are being treated a partial response which means a better than 50 percent improvement from where you started is actually pretty good the whole idea is to get symptom and disease control if you sometimes are so aggressive that you push to try and make things perfect you might actually create some of the problems that we're talking about particularly those very low immunoglobulin levels and that's an issue for these in persistent infections, phlegm buildup and the like. All right, great. Well, Dr. Ansel, thank you for your, your time and your presentation today. Uh, it was very helpful. You, you've uh, answered lots of questions for individuals. There are many questions we didn't get to, but everyone should know that Dr. Ansel is gonna be coming back later today for the Ask the Doctors Live Q&A panel. And so if your question didn't get addressed now, you might have a chance to ask the panel to address it this afternoon. Uh, so in addition to thanking Dr. Ansel, I wanna thank the people who put all those great questions out there. Unfortunately, there just wasn't enough time to get to them all. Uh, remember to complete the brief survey that pops up right after the session ends. And uh, I also wanna take this opportunity to extend our gratitude to this year's Ed Forum sponsors Beijing, Pharmacyclics, Janssen, as well as Selector Biosciences, the Treadway Foundation, and X4 Pharmaceuticals. Um, remember to close uh, the current tab when you're finished answering the survey, and then go to the theater tab to uh, open your next session. Thank you all for your participation.